You are worthy. What madness is this? I will choose oblivion over this existence. Use your hatred to weave their sorrows. I can make it possible. Become my soul lover. My angel of death. a magical operation of maximum importance. The initiation of a new Aeon. When it becomes necessary to utter a word, the whole planet must be bathed in blood. Have you ever played a game series that you could honestly say probably changed your life for the better? To me, that's the Legacy of Kane series. I love this franchise. And it's rather disheartening that we never really got the ending, the conclusion, that we all deserved. But despite some of its shortcomings, it's still one of the best franchises that I've ever seen. And I know there's a lot of fans out there. I know you're like me and you want this game to come back. You want this series to come back. And although I'm sure that this YouTube video is not going to accomplish that, I'm still happy to share my memories and give you all my thoughts on this forgotten gem that sadly may have been lost to history. So without further ado, let's get on with this video. And thank you.
The Legacy of Cain was first conceptualized by series creator Dennis Dyack, who in 1993 created a document which included potential ideas and illustrations for three different gaming franchises. The first of which being what he referred to as the Pillars of Nazgoth. The second was actually Too Human, which was later made into a video game. The third has never been released to the public, and would be purely up to speculation. Although created in 1993, it would not be until 1994 when series writer Ken McCulloch would actually help Dennis Dyack finalize the script and help him finishing with the ideas for the legacy of Cain Bloodham. While working on the game Dark Legions, Dyack and McCulloch would work on the legacy of Cain in their free time between projects. Envisioned as a top town dark fantasy RPG the game was created to be almost a direct parallel for the most common RPG games at the time, notably games such as The Legend of Zelda. Dayok wanted to create a game similar to The Legend of Zelda, but one made more for adults that dealt with complex themes and more ambiguity. Early influences for the game included the movie The Unforgiven by Clint Eastwood. In the movie Unforgiven, most characters were really just shades of gray, with it being really hard to know who the true good guy was and the true bad guy was. Parts of that movie, it would seem like Clint Eastwood was nothing but a good guy, but later on in the movie, you would come to question that early preconception. Most RPGs at the time always had a good guy and a bad guy. Dennis Dyack had felt like that formula was getting very stale. Hence the reason why Dyak had initially taken the four-way into the legacy of Cain. After conceptualizing the original concept, there was only one thing left for them to do, which was to try to find a publisher that would back them so that they could create the game that they envisioned. So the two Silicon Knights members would take their ideas and begin pitching them to multiple different companies. While at a gaming convention in 1994, Dyack would meet Lyle Hall, who was a producer of the company Crystal Dynamics. They would go on to have a conversation and realize that they both held similar opinions on where the gaming industry should begin to head. You see, back then, games weren't really cinematic experiences. The two believed that the medium could be a perfect platform to create games that had more of an artistic vision as opposed to just being a game that you would pick up and play for 15-20 minutes and then put down. Both feeling that there was an untapped market for adults that could get into gaming. With games being at the time really mostly for kids, they wanted to take the chance and try to be the pioneers of a whole new division of video games. After being impressed by the scope of the project, Crystal Dynamics would give Dennis Dyack and the team at Silicon Knights the green light to begin production. Planned at this point to be developed for the 3DO, this would change when Sony announced their Sony PlayStation, recognizing how much easier it would be to develop the game for the PlayStation than the 3DO. Crystal Dynamics would switch development over to the Sony PlayStation instead first trailers for the game would be released at E3 of 1995, and did see a lot of praise and interest from gamers and journalists alike. After seeing the interest garnered by the E3 trailer, it was decided that Crystal Dynamics would take more of a role in the development of the game. Crystal Dynamics would then send some of its top programmers and writers to aid in speeding up production. One of these writers was actually Amy Hennig who would go on to become the series director of the Legacy of Kane series from Soul Reaver onward. Although the development was now in full swings, as like with most gaming development stages, there was a few hiccups along the way. Most notably, the switch from the 3DO to the PlayStation caused Silicon Knights to have to compromise on the quality of the in-game cinematics, which were not formatted to play on a Sony PlayStation. Realizing this just a little bit too late into development, they would eventually have to lower the resolution 
just to be able to get the in-game cinematics into the game. Another issue that they would have to overcome would be that the Sony PlayStation only had 3 megs of RAM, with 2 megs dedicated to data and 1 meg dedicated to video. The problem with that is that Blood Omen would actually require 2.5 megs of data for graphics and 0.5 megs of data for video, which led them to have to store megs of data on the Sony PlayStation itself. This would in turn cause excessive load times. So yeah, if you've played this game and you were wondering why the load times were so bad, it's because of this. Although these missteps would pale in comparison to the disheartening issues that would soon arise. Before the trailer debut at E3 of 1995, an internal argument arose between Silicon Knights and Crystal Dynamics. Silicon Knights felt that they should be the one to receive the credit as the developers of the game. Crystal Dynamics felt that they should be the one to receive the credit. This unfortunate turn of events would eventually be settled in a lawsuit years later. At one point, there was even two different versions of Soul Reaver in development at the same time, with Silicon Knights creating their version of Soul Reaver and Crystal Dynamics creating their own. Crystal Dynamics would later retain the rights to the Legacy of Cain series, and the Soul Reaver game we know of today would be the result of that. Blood Omen would launch on August 31st of 1997 and was well received by critics and gamers. At the time of this writing, the game currently still holds a Metacritic score of 8.6, even 22 years later. So right off the bat in regards to the gameplay, I just wanted to be known that I had originally played this game when I was a teenager, I think I might have played it for like 20 minutes, put it down, as I was getting my ass beat, I didn't know what to do, um, so I, I never really went back to it until I set out to make this series, and now that I have, I'm actually really glad that I went back to play this, because it's actually really good, it's really fun, uh, a lot of people say that it's like The Legend of Zelda, I personally believe it's more like Diablo the original Diablo, but I do see why people think it looks a lot like Zelda, which in my mind is not really, you know, a disgrace to the game or anything. If anything, it's it's an honor that they would say this game was like Legend of Zelda, considering how big that franchise is. Uh, but, you know, with that being said, what I do want to say is the gameplay is kind of bittersweet for me, and uh, the, the reason being is... This, I had the most fun with this game compared to all the other games. And I kind of wish that maybe that Soul Reaver you know, 1, Soul Reaver 2, Defiance, those games were a little more like this game. Because you could do a lot more in this game. Uh, I mean, this is one of the, aside from Zelda, this is the one of like the first kind of open world games I remember playing. And this game right here, it truly is a pioneer in that regard you know you can even fast travel and which is pretty cool um, I can't really remember a time before this when you could fast travel like that and uh, I mean I'm sure you guys are gonna correct me in the comments you know which is fine please correct me in the comments but uh, you know I just had to get that said so we're gonna start off with transformations and uh, the the first thing that I wanna you know get to is the bat transformation so the bat transformation is the thing I was just telling you guys about. That's basically your fast travel, where Kane turns into a bat and he's able to fly uh, to get to a new point. Uh, there's some parts in the game where you have to find what's called the vista points, and then you have to be able to see the place you need to go next. Like right here um, in this video, you can see I'm looking for Malik's Bastion, and it took me a while to actually find it because I just kept walking around trying to go you know to the town that you saw that was next to Alex Bastion right there and thinking that I can make it that way but what ended up happening as you can see the map um, up there towards the top is is all colored in because you actually had to go all the way up there and you had to find a vista point which was really really fucking confusing and I could totally see why some people would not get that and maybe they would even stop playing the game back when this game came out because of that right there that specific thing uh, but once I figured it out it wasn't too bad I think there's one more time you got to do that in the game 
to actually make it to your next your next objective but uh, other than that it really wasn't that bad so the next one is going to be his wolf transformation and if you guys have been on my channel at all if you watched any of my other videos you probably already know how I feel about werewolves and I fucking hate werewolves and if you want to hear my thoughts on that go back to my re age trash video and uh, so it's kind of stupid man he's a vampire you know why can he turn into a werewolf he's a he's a fucking vampire that doesn't even make any sense uh, now I know they must have realized this because in every game after this one we'd never see him transform into a vampire ever oh, I'm sorry into a werewolf ever again ever again period you know it's just kind of dropped I mean it in this game I don't mind it so much for one reason and one reason only you can move around the map way faster if you're actually in the werewolf form which kinda saves you some time but if it wasn't for that I would seriously question why it's even in this game you know another thing you can do is you can jump up to basically on the plateaus and you can get up there and you can find secrets and stuff like that but it is kinda weird and almost lore breaking that that he could do this and then we just never see it again kind of the same thing with the bat transformation you know he basically turns into a bunch of little bats and then flies away which again we never see in the series ever again so it's kind of like so what are these are these like Kane's fledgling powers or something and if so that's kind of weird because that means that Kane got weaker over time as opposed to getting stronger which I do not understand at all but you know it really doesn't matter because uh, he does have a teleport spell in later games but he never turns into the bats ever again so uh, the next one we're gonna go over is called peasant and what that is is basically Kane he can use like an illusion spell to make himself look like he's just a normal villager now if you get too close to uh, the guards or if you hit anybody then the spell will break and they will be able to basically realize that you're a vampire and they'll start coming after you later on in the game you get another transformation called nobleman which is the same idea except you know this time they think you're a nobleman and honestly there really isn't too much to say about this one because I really didn't use it all that much and it never again it never comes back in the series there's a lot of dropped concepts in this game that I've noticed which actually kind of makes sense uh, only based on the fact that if you were paying attention to the intro of the video then you know that there was the whole lawsuit that happened between Silicon Knights and Crystal Dynamics but uh, Crystal Dynamics actually won that lawsuit and so basically Soul Reaver was their game you know I mean they basically created it from scratch aside from story concepts that had already been made by Dennis Dyack and um, so I mean like I said you know it really it really just it makes sense that they kind of changed a bunch of things you know if you guys think about like Star Wars when Disney how Disney just completely ruined that crap by changing stuff kind of the same idea so we get to the last transformation which is actually the only transformation um, that actually comes back in any way shape or form in the series and that is his mist form and uh, unfortunately in this game you can't use it to like sneak up behind people and execute them you know in a stealth like manner um, but but it is there and it helps you what it helps you do is it helps you make it through doors like gates and things like that you kind of just turn into a mist form and then you can just kind of pass through it just kind of like Raziel when he goes into the spectral realm in the, the future games. Uh, another thing that's really cool about it actually is when you're in mist form, um, it, the rain doesn't hurt you, the water doesn't hurt you, so it actually opens up some new parts of the map. There's actually a lot of secrets out there that you can find by walking over the water, but of course you can't access that until you get the mist form which is quite a ways into the game. I'd say about a, no, it's not that bad. Maybe it's about a third into the game. And uh, then you get the miss one. So uh, let's, let's talk about his spells and abilities. So uh, the first one I want to bring up is the light spell. This spell is a must have because so many of the dungeons in this game, you can't see shit. 
And I'm so happy they included this spell because it actually makes it, you know, playable. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to say that and make it sound negative, but it's the truth. You know, it's really, 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 really effing hard to see things, uh, especially in a game for, you know, from this era. It's hard to tell if something is a switch or not. It's hard to tell if you're going the right way. Sometimes it's hard to tell if there's water in the dungeon. You touch it, you get hurt, and now you're pissed off because you can't see shit. So I'm really, really happy that they actually included that one. Next one I'm going to mention is the lightning spell, which basically just gives you Sith lightning. So I'm sure you can imagine what that's like. It works pretty good, damages people pretty good. Um, all in all, it's a pretty good spell, and uh, I'd recommend you guys doing the extra legwork to go and find it because it is actually what they consider to be a secret spell yeah there's secret spells in this game it's pretty cool because I mean you have like the four or the five little notches where you can put your spells so at first you think you know you get those five spells and that's it right there's not gonna be any more no no there's all kinds of hidden spells in this game usually they're hidden behind what's known as a moon door and uh, to get through those, basically you have to wait until the moon is full, which happens about once every hour in game time. So sometimes it can be kind of a hassle, it really just depends on how bad you want to do you know, the completion of the game, or if you just want to beat it to go through the storyline, which we'll get into later. Fucking awesome. But um, yeah, so you know, it's definitely worth going out and going out of your way and getting. And so after that we get to the Control Mind spell. This one's pretty cool too. It actually helps you out through a lot of puzzles that you end up running into in the game. I remember the first time I got it, or right before I got it, I thought I was stuck in a dungeon. And there was nothing I can do and I wasn't going to be able to get out. And then I got that spell. Uh, one thing I will mention about this is if you're going to use this spell, make sure that you kill all other people around you except for one person because if you don't what's going to happen is you're going to use it to control the mind of that bad guy or that enemy whatever you want to call it and then he's going to start walking around but he's somehow they know that that is you like somehow they know Kane is controlling this guy's mind so they'll just straight kill him on sight so yeah make sure you kill all the enemies and then uh, usually use it for switches that are not accessible by Kane and any other means. So uh, basically, you know, I probably should have started with this, but here you go. So it take control of the mind of one of the enemies, and then basically you can use him to walk around to help you with the puzzles that are in the dungeons. Which, by the way, there's a lot of puzzles, and uh, I assume that's why people feel like this game is a lot like Zelda, because there's hella puzzles. So then the next one is another secret spell, and uh, what this one is, is it's called Spirit Wreck. Um, you actually find this right outside of Avernus, and it's just um, outside of Willendorf. And uh, so what this one is, is it's an upgraded version of the Control Mind spell. But it really, it really doesn't do much more than the Control Mind spell. Um, unfortunately, it's useless against bosses, uh, you know. It's, I like a lot of things in this game it was dropped and we never see it again now fun fact with this one is this was actually going to make a return in the original soul weaver and um, it was going to be an ability that you would gain from the priestess called possess which is exactly the same thing as control mind but because that part of the game was cut out we never actually seen it which is fine of me because it's pretty much a useless spell so yeah Moving on, uh, you know, let's go with an easy one. Let's go with the Sanctuary spell. So this one, it basically just sends you back to Kane's mausoleum anytime you think you're about to die. But this spell actually has the ability to break the game. I don't know if they even realize this. And uh, I don't know if I'm the only one experienced this because I am playing this game emulated on auto bleam. So maybe that's why I had this issue. But so I was in a dungeon at the early part of the game maybe I'd played for about 45 minutes and I was getting my ass beat so I decided to go back to the sanctuary to to heal right because I mean that's what the spell is for so I go back to the sanctuary and uh, then I quickly realized that I'm locked out of the dungeon like I, I couldn't even get back into the dungeon 
No, no, maybe I'm a dumbass and I didn't know how to use the spell. Uh, actually, now that I'm talking about it, I'm wondering if I use the sanctuary spell a second time, if it would just send me back into the same dungeon. Hopefully not, because then I'll just feel like a dumbass. But oh well, I'm already a dumbass, so I guess it don't really matter. But uh, yeah, so that's the sanctuary spell. Be careful, because if you use it and the doors are locked, after you go into a dungeon, then you're going to be stuck in that dungeon, and there's going to be pretty much a no way for you to be able to you know, progress in the game. And you know what, since we're on the topic of that, I've noticed that there are there are things that I feel like you shouldn't be able to do. Uh, like, there's parts at the beginning, when you're going up towards Corhagen, uh, where you shouldn't actually be able to get in there. You're supposed to find a blood fountain first, and uh, we'll get to the blood fountains in Loa. But uh, you're supposed to go to a blood fountain, and then that's how you move a rock that's on a bridge to get over to Corhagen. But what I did was I just turned into the werewolf form, and I ran across the water so I didn't die. And then I just kind of followed the uh, the entrails, you know, like there's like a little, like, beach, you know, kind of area right there. So I just followed that along the edge. And eventually I, I found a way where I feel like I'm probably glitched into Corhagen. Um, but it, it worked. So again, I don't know if that was a bug or not, because I mean, it kind of reminded me of when you're playing Elder Scrolls. And you don't want to have to go all the way around the mountain, so you just kind of jump over and over again to get over the mountain. Um, that's what it felt like to me. So let's let's talk about a spell that's actually useful. Uh, Repel. You need this spell. This spell is going to save your life so many times. There are parts in this game where you're going to go walk into a room, there's going to be hella enemies, and they're all throwing projectiles at you, and they're all throwing projectiles that are faster than how fast you can swing your sword, your mace, or your axes. And it's pretty fucking annoying until you get the repel spell, which is, it reminds me of a ward. It, it's funny that we were just talking about, about, uh, sorry, uh, the Elder Scrolls, because it is just like a ward, except with this one, you can actually bounce projectiles off of you. And uh, if you're good enough with it, you can actually get the projectiles to hit the enemy and it'll damage the enemies too. So this is a great spell. You need this. If you don't get anything, you need to get this one, and you need to get the energy bolt spell, uh, which is the next one we're going to talk about. F it, let's do it right now. So the energy bolt spell is pretty much what it sounds like. It's kind of like the Sif lightning, right, that we were talking about earlier, except it's like a projectile. It's just it's almost like a what's the word I'm looking for? Like a Hadouken kind of thing, right? And uh, you can use it to hit switches that are extremely far out of the way and so when you get that spell that one actually helps you a lot too and it also helps because you know you you get other spells that you have basically like you only have a limited supply of and so the energy bolt as long as you have magic is is basically an unlimited an unlimited spell which you're gonna need for some of the harder parts in the game all right, so next let's talk about incapacitate. This spell is a godsend. Like it, it really, really, really helps you out. Basically, you use it and it stops enemies in their tracks, freezes them for a short period of time, which gives Kane plenty of time to either feed or to finish off the enemy. And it helps out a lot because there's a lot of times in this game where it's going to take, especially when you're fighting like the demon enemies as opposed to the human enemies, they're going to be able to take a lot of damage. So it's really good that this is in there. It, you know, In conjunction with the mace, it helps out a lot. It's kind of overpowered when you use the mace with this because with the, you know, the mace, it basically does the same thing. It, you know, it puts people into a stun state after you hit them like two times. So if you hit them with the mace and then you use incapacitate, then it's pretty much any enemy is down for the count. So that that's a really a really good spell that he has in it, in his repertoire. So um, the next one we're gonna talk about is inspire hate, and it's a spell that I think it was overlooked by a lot of people. I know it was overlooked by me uh, the first time I went through Corhagen, especially because you're not really looking for too many secrets in, in Corhagen because that's still kind of early in the game you don't really realize just how many secret spells and things like that are out there and uh, so basically it's found in the basement of one of the houses in Corhagen 
And uh, what it does is, if say you're getting attacked by hella enemies, you know, you got like four enemies coming and attacking you, and you're getting destroyed, uh, use this spell, and you can get away. They're basically going to start to fight each other, instead of focusing so much on you, but be careful, because if you get too close, just like the, the um, you know, the, the, spe the transformation that turned you into a peasant, then uh, they'll still be able to realize that it's you, and they will still, you know, turn around and come after you if they realize it's you so if you're going to use it try to use it from a distance because that's the only way that it's really effective um and staying off line with some of the lesser known spells let's talk about one called blood shower and uh, you actually get this in four doors mansion um, a lot of people might not even realize that this spell was in there because as far as i know you know i've talked to a lot of people who played this game they didn't even realize this was a spell and so what this does is basically if you've ever seen gameplay where someone's like drinking the blood of more than one victim it's because they're using this spell they have this ability to and what what it is is you can basically you know feed off of up to four different victims but the thing that's bad about this spell is that when you use it if you start to feed on the blood of demons you know you start to see the green or the black blood that stuff will actually poison you rendering this spell pretty much pointless especially after you get the blood armor because the blood armor would just do all that shit for you now i know sometimes you know you're not going to be able to wear the blood armor but still it's still kind of like why ever use this when you can just use the blood armor which is way better anyways and uh yeah so i mean it's pretty stupid to me moving on to the next one so the next one is kind of like the cousin of that other spell it's called blood gout and uh, what this one does is basically Kane can make a projectile using his own blood. Uh, you find this in the Cherigit Forest. Um, so if you hit them, right, then you gain their blood and then therefore you don't lose any blood. But if you miss the enemy, then Kane literally just loses some of his life. And later on in the game, with the stronger enemies, it takes more than one hit of the projectile to actually kill them and it's completely useless against the bosses so it's really useless to even use this spell and uh, this is another one that I actually see why I never came back because all it really did was, was be a hindrance to Kane overall so uh, yeah I mean I'm not gonna indulge it any more than that because yeah man I barely ever used it and uh, most people probably won't really use it all that much so that finally wraps it up for his spells and his abilities, and uh, I gotta say, I mean, that's a lot of spells and abilities, huh guys? You know what's crazy about this? You know how many of these ever actually come back in the series? Almost none of them. So it's like, you can really see that there was this huge, like, disconnect between Part 1 and Soul Reaver, so Blood Omen and Soul Reaver, and you can really tell that it really was a different team that actually made Soul Reaver in comparison to Blood Omen simply because like I was saying earlier in the video there was just so many dropped concepts in this game it's, it's not even funny uh, although I have to say it makes sense especially because Soul Reaver is just such a different game compared to Blood Omen um, it's almost like two completely different franchises and it's not even like and Blood Omen 2 went back to this old school way of, you know, of the gameplay, because it really didn't, you know, Blood Omen 2 is kind of its own thing. Um, I'll talk more about that when we get to the Blood Omen 2 video, uh, but as a little preview to that, and I know you guys are probably going to think I'm crazy, but when I played Blood Omen 2, it always gave me this, this Max Payne vibe, and I don't really know why, I think maybe it's the level geometry or something about it but for some reason it just always kind of felt like max pain to me you know even though i know we don't have guns and stuff and like i said we'll get more into detail about that in the blood omen 2 video so for now let's just move on to to the items that you get in the game with kane so right off the bat we have the most important one to talk about um, which is actually the Heart of Darkness is probably I think it's the very first one that you get and uh, With me being a huge fan of this series But uh, you know like I told you guys I played this when I was a teen and then I didn't go back to it until later 
uh, when I decided to make this series. When I started the game and I seen the Heart of Darkness, I was like mind blown. Like, what the fuck, dude? So he's had the Heart of Darkness the whole time. And if you guys, which I mean, let's be real here. If you're not a fan of this series, then you probably wouldn't be watching this video. But I mean, damn. Like, that's some consistency right there. For him to have the Heart of Darkness at the very beginning of the very first game, it makes perfect sense. You know, because he's supposed to have the Heart of Darkness. You know, I mean, obviously, it's not an item, it's just supposed to be inside of him, but, you know, he's still supposed to have it. So when I seen that, I just thought that was really, really fucking cool. Um, I know that it might have been accidental coincidence. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just cool to see that it almost feels like, like it was all planned, right, from the beginning, which most of it was, but there's no way that Dennis Dyack could have seen into the future like that, and, uh, like wrote every last inch of this story, they you know, the, the claim that he did, and there's even claims that the game that would have came out, Dark Prophecy, which was going to be the, the final part of the Legacy of Kane series, um, that the story had already been written. I'm sure it had, but I really don't think he wrote that story in 1994 with with uh, McCulloch. You know, like I would I would really find that hard to believe. So uh, the the next one I'm going to talk about is called Implode, and uh, it's kind of like a spell. And I might have mentioned this in the spells because I always kind of get it, you know, confused. But basically, it just it uh, you point at an enemy and you use it and uh, it implodes right like everything from the inside gets sucked in like there's a black hole and then their organs there's blood splattering everywhere and it's, it's disgusting you know and it's, it's pretty hardcore and on uh, in the game there's a part where Kane talks about it and he's like you know of all the things that I employ this one might be the worst and uh, it's a pretty cool little quote if you play this game and you'll hear it or you could just go on YouTube and look for it if you really want to but I've always loved that quote just because it really shows like how badass Kane is um, especially with him being the whole dark antagonist thing or protagonist thing you know that I was talking about earlier um, with you know because obviously they want him to be more of an anti-hero an anti than anything else hey guys so this is actually future Vic boss here so I am sorry about the unprofessionalism of this about going back and then splicing this into the video but when I was listening back to this and I was listening to the part about the heart of darkness I just thought it was really funny because I was sitting there thinking about it and um, I was like maybe this is why Kane in Soul Reaver Defiance or yeah no in Defiance like see Kane Defiance he didn't care about the whole heart of darkness thing He's like I don't care where it is Razia and it was Razia I was like you don't know where it is do you because uh, to Kane, it was just a heart on a fucking card, right? Because if we're going back to the first game, um, to him, it's just an item that he used. You know, he, he didn't really think it was, like, inside of his body or shit like that. And he's like, oh, you know, who gives a fuck about the heart of darkness? I got 15 of those. You know, so I just thought that was something that was kind of funny. Um, so once again, yeah, this was a uh, future, future Brandon, basically, just coming. I had to add that to the video right there so but thank you for your thanks for hearing me back to the regular video okay so next let's talk about flay so flay it looks like it's a ninja star and when you're when you're looking at your items um it pretty much works the exact same way that implode works except obviously it's not imploding your enemies um you can just imagine as like a, a ninja star that explodes pretty much um, that's flay that's all there really is to say about it. It's pretty useful up until you get the energy bolt. But then as soon as you get the energy bolt, it's pretty much useless after that. So, uh, you know, it's just good to, to have it for the early game. Other than that, I never really found myself using it too much. Alright, so um, after that we got what's called antitoxin. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's just pretty much like an antidote that cures cane of any poison. It's pretty useful when you get to Eden, Dark Eden. Other than that, you barely use it throughout the rest of the game. You do find it right before you get into Dark Eden, so you have it when you need it. Um, but it's pretty much another one of these uh, abilities or these items that are just kind of dropped and we never really see again. Um, don't worry guys, I'm about to start speeding this up because I want to get into the story. So we're almost there. Uh, if you're bored right now, then just uh, skip ahead to the story part. 
but if you're if you're like me, you know, you're a big fan and you wanna you really wanna go into depth about these games, then uh, you know, just stay stick with me. We're almost there. So thanks. So on to the next item. Alright, so this one's gonna be the Pentolith of Tarot. Um, this one I don't even know why this one's in the game. It's it's pretty much a spell that will randomly pick one of five different spells and uh, it'll kill all the enemies who are within close proximity of you it, it's kind of like gambling on how you want to kill the enemies so again i'm not really sure why this was thrown in there um, but it's there so we got to talk about it moving on next we have the font of putrescence uh, this one's a lot like decay that we talked about back in the spells section of the video um, except with this one after you destroy an enemy they basically like melt into acid and leave like an acid pool where you kill them that can potentially hurt other enemies um, this one's pretty cool the icon for it looks like a bunch of maggots so it's kind of gross um, but you know it does the trick so uh, I mean it's not super important or anything but it, it helps but but to be real with you I mean it there really isn't too many situations that you're going to be using it all that much so it's an if eh, it's okay so next here we have what is called energy bank and uh, what what this does is basically it gives you unlimited mana for a small period of time and then once you use it all then you, you actually can't regenerate your mana for again a small period of time so the only time I'd recommend using this is when you're fighting against the bosses as otherwise you're just gonna lose all of your all of your mana and then if you lose all your mana you're gonna kind of be fucked so uh, please don't do that don't make that mistake especially towards the later parts of the game where there really isn't too many people to get blood from you're fighting more demons and shit like that uh, which is something we'll talk about in the story section but one thing I love about this game is how like you, you kind of start as a, you start as a good guy, but then by the end of the game, Kane's just a total asshole, pretty much killing everybody in sight. You know, he's he's fucking drinking the blood from everybody he can find, and uh, that's all pretty much because you know there's not enough health for you. But uh, I digress. So then the last one is slow time. Yep, we finally fucking made it. It's like 30 minutes in, but we're here. Uh, so slow time it does exactly what it sounds like it slows down time and it gives you a chance to fight enemies especially when you're surrounded by uh, ranged enemies and they're just throwing like endless projectiles at you and shit it gets pretty annoying pretty quickly um, I mean obviously the first thing you want to do is is put up your protect spell to deflect some of those projectiles back to the enemies but then another thing you can do is you can use slow time in conjunction with that and it'll actually help you out quite a bit got me out of quite a few jams so it's definitely one that you want to look for it's definitely one you want to find and you usually get it after you get the mist form you walk across a uh, what's it called like a lake over in the western part of the map and then you find it uh, within a secret hidden over there All right, so let's knock out swords and armor real quick. So you start the game with the iron sword Pretty basic generic sword. It's an iron sword does exactly what you think an iron sword would do and uh, Yeah, pretty standard and same thing with the iron armor basic plain ass iron armor That's all you really need to know about that uh, the next weapon you're gonna get is the mace which helps out a lot like you really need to go and get the mace you hit someone twice it stuns them you know you can drink their blood get some more health and that's really gonna help you out quite a bit quite a bit so you really need that now one my favorite weapon in the game is actually the one you get after that which is the axes which is uh, the reason why this game reminds me of Diablo so much because with the axes if you successfully hit somebody twice then the third axe swing will turn into whirlwind like a, what's it called like a, a barbarian can do in Diablo 2 and that's why this game reminds me so much of Diablo is actually because of that one move right there and it works the exact same way as it, as it does in Diablo so you guys definitely need to, if you know you need to go out your way you need to go and find those axes don't go anywhere unless you find those fucking axes um, it's gonna be up towards 
Vordor's manner. Um, yeah, but easily, hands down, the best weapon in the game. Well, aside from the next one, um, which would actually be the Flame Sword. Uh, this one works really good against demons. Um, the uh, the axes does actually work way better against the humans, but the Flame Sword is going to work good against the demons in the game. So anytime you're going up against demons, you're going to want to use that. Also, uh, once you get to Avernus Cathedral, uh, I don't remember her name right now, but we'll, you know, I'll mention it once we get to the story part. But her her boss battle is a lot easier if you actually use the Flame Sword. You use Protect Spell and the Flame Sword, and it uh, works pretty good. And then, of course, we got the Mother of All Swords after that, which is the Soul Reaver. And the Soul Reaver, just like in all the other, I mean, it fucking demolishes, right? That's what it does. It's the fucking Soul Reaver. So, yeah. Get the Soul Reaver. Uh, fun fact about the Soul Reaver. It was never supposed to be in the Legacy of Cain. It was actually made to be in Too Human. But Dennis Dyack decided that he wanted to take it out of Too Human. And put it into the Legacy of Cain. Which, could you guys imagine? Like the way things would be if he never did that if he never put the uh, the soul reaver into the legacy of Cain, man that's like a weird parallel dimension right there so uh, going on to the armor okay so we got we already mentioned the iron armor let's talk about the bone armor and i got a couple things to say about this one real quick so the way you get it is you go back to Cain's hometown of Corhagen and uh, you find it in a mausoleum it's like under, it's like in an undercroft underneath the city and uh, you put it on and actually wraiths will completely avoid you for some reason when you have this armor on uh, they don't want to be anywhere near Kane like undead and all the shades in the game will just avoid Kane entirely which is pretty fucking overpowered the thing that I want to say about this one the reason I wanted to talk about this armor is because you would think that Kane would want to keep this and that's pretty fucking useful especially like later on in the timeline when the, you know it's basically he's ruling over a wasteland and wraiths are everywhere you know I mean you got Raziel I mean, I'm pretty sure he's a wraith uh, I guess technically he's not but not nah, fuck no nah, no nah, yeah he is he's a wraith even though I'm sure it wouldn't work on Raziel I, I at least know that it would work on like the lower wraiths so I've just always kind of wondered like what did he do with that armor did he put it back in core hanging you know did the whole timeline shifting when he goes back in time in this game which we'll get into that too a little bit later but so um, he goes back in time right like did that change the timeline to where he never found the bone armor ever or something is that like what's going on with that because you would really think that he'd want to have that so uh, that's that's my little rant on the bone armor. Uh, it's pretty cool, you know, it helps you out quite a bit. But uh, let's go let, let's go on to the next bit of armor. And this one's gonna be the chaos armor. Now this is easily the best looking armor in the entire game. I mean, it is so badass. I mean, there's like fangs on the joints. There's faces, you know what I mean? Like like engraved into the armor itself. Uh, it's just it looks badass like I'll put a picture on the screen right here at this part uh, I mean, it's just fucking awesome. I, I really wish that well hell if I was Kane I would have saved it. I definitely would have saved that armor for sure Especially because of its ability. So what it does is when an enemy attacks you And he hits you when you have that armor on all the damage that he would have dealt to you is just reflected back at the enemy so, I mean, it's it's OP AF, right guys? I mean, damn. Not only does it look good, but you could literally just walk around not doing anything, letting everybody kill themselves. So, again, why he didn't keep this armor either, I it's just beyond me. I'm just going to fall back to the trope of, t you know, separate timeline screwed everything up. Because that's the only thing that makes any sense. But even then, I mean, this armor's still somewhere in the world. He has the knowledge. That this stuff is out there so you would think even after the whole timeline thing like he would go back and you know not even that but he comes back to the present time so i'm sorry guys i'm getting in the story beats i need to save those but i'm just saying this this armor looks pretty badass and i really wish 
I really wish he would have kept it and he would have held on to this. And I'm sure he, he probably wishes that he would have held on to it too. Alright, so now we are at the flesh armor. And uh, this armor, it's not very like aesthetically pleasing. But it's easily the armor that helps you out the most. Um, aside from the bone armor. Uh, because it actually, what it does is... Instead of you having to sit there for like three seconds and watch the whole animation of, of Kane sucking blood to get health, it just absorbs the health up for you, which is a huge, huge, huge time save. Like, seriously, I don't understand to this day. And it's worse, somehow it's worse in Blood Omen 2, but uh, especially in this game, it always annoyed me how long you had to sit there and wait for Kane to like suck up the blood you know and, and to be able to get his health back like it was the most annoying thing in the world at times and you know especially with this game because it, it can be kind of sluggish at times um it was really really getting annoying so uh now we're at the last set of armor this is the wraith armor um you get this in Avernus Cathedral and uh, basically it exists in two different realms. It's like partially in the physical realm and it's partially in the spectral realm or the wraith realm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what it does is it actually divides the damage you take up between your health bar and your, your mana meter or your magic meter, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I mean, eh, yeah, you know, I mean, I guess that's kind of cool, but I mean, if, if you don't absolutely suck at the game, then you don't really need it. And uh, the only thing that's interesting about this is who the hell made this? You know, I mean, seriously, in lore, who the hell could have had the power to make this? Um, I actually do have one theory. It's a crazy tinfoil hat theory. And um, at the end of this video, I'm going to go over some crazy theories I have about this game. Not about the whole series, but about this game. So keep this in mind. Because I am going to bring this up again. And you guys are probably going to just think I'm, I'm fucking nuts. Which is cool. Because I probably am. I mean I'm sitting here making like a almost a two hour long video about a game that came out way back in the day. But that's just how much I love the series. So uh, that's it guys. So all we got to do now is just talk about, you know, kind of wrap up the gameplay section. So the only couple things that I really didn't get into was there's these things called moon doors. Right? And... It, Basically, you find like blood shrines behind most of them, and you have to wait till the moon is full. And it kind of sucks because I think it's like once every two hours in gameplay. So sometimes you literally just have to put the controller down and just walk away and just wait for the moon, you know, to be a full moon, so that you can get into that shrine and get whatever little power up it is that you that you need to get, which can get pretty annoying at times. Then the, the other thing I didn't mention was there's these things called spirit forges. And you go there, you sacrifice some of your blood, and then they provide you with special items. Which usually just end up being like some kind of treasure chest hidden in the back that's full of like flay or slow time. You know, items like that. Nothing really too spectacular or anything. So nothing to really write home about. And of course we got the blood shrines. And uh, the blood shrines, what they do is pretty much, you know, there's ones that are going to make you stronger. There's ones that are going to up your mana bar. And there's ones that are going to make it so that when it's raining, it doesn't hurt you. So there are some good things that you can get over at the blood fountains. Um, but pretty much they're tied to progression. Because a lot of the times, like, there'll be, a, there'll be a stone that you need to move, but you won't be strong enough to move it. Until you can find one of those blood shrines, one of the blood shrines of strength. And then that's how you're able to proceed on. So, all in all, it's a pretty good game, man. It's kind of unfortunate because the gameplay, like, in the rest of this series, it just kind of takes a nosedive. Now, the story gets way better, even though I do like the story of this game. But, um, pretty much the only thing that any game in the series after this one has on this game is story. Because... For some reason, man, like this this game has the best gameplay in the whole series, even though it can be kind of slow at times and it can be kind of a chore sometimes. But I mean, if you've played Soul Reaver, then you, you know how much of a chore that game actually is. So I think you already know what I'm talking about. I don't feel like I would need to elaborate on that. 
Of course, I'll make a video on Soul Reaver too, so we can talk more about that when we get to Soul Reaver. But yeah, but yeah, all in all, it's a good game. I definitely recommend it. Um, if, if you guys have never played it, give it a shot. This game needs a remake. Like this game would be fucking amazing if they would just make it into a remake. Um, it, this game definitely needs the remake treatment for sure. So uh, that's it, guys. You made it. You're alive. Let's let's finally go on to the story. Fulfilling the circle of Malak of the Sapphire, you are hereby damned. The pleasures of the flesh are no longer You have but one of us, damned one. You will serve us for eternity. So, in order to cover the events of Blood Omen, we first need to go and take a look at some backstory. So, hundreds of years before Blood Omen takes place, there, there is a war between humans and vampires. The vampires are growing exponentially, uh, threatening to pretty much take over the world. So, in retaliation, the humans create what is known as the Seraphim, who are basically a religious fanatical group that's out to do nothing but kill vampires. But the thing is with that is that they're very violent. I mean, it looks more like the Seraphim are the bad guys in comparison to the vampires. Even though, you know, we all know the vampires are, are mostly in the wrong, but yeah, the Seraphim are straight assholes. You know, I mean, they're brutal with their tactics. So, out of retaliation for this, Vordor, who at the time was one of the eldest vampires aside from Vanis Aldrin, who is supposed to be dead, um, he, he goes into the Seraphim stronghold and he kills six members of the Circle of Nine, including Malik. So seven total. And that's why I showed that video just now. That's actually what happened there. So just keep that in mind because it's going to be important a little later down the road. Now the next important event that happens before Blood Omen starts is a few decades before Blood Omen. Uh, the Guardian uh, Ario is actually assassinated, which sends her lover Nup Raptor into a severe severe deep de like dark depression and the pillars of Nazgoth are inherently connected to their guardians so if one of them 
starts going crazy, basically, his corruption will bleed over into the other members of the Circle of Nine, and they will begin to basically go crazy as well, which is actually what happens, uh, which is why the Pillars are beginning to become corrupt. So that's all you really need to know for the backstory. So the game starts. We see Cain, who's a nobleman from the village of Corhagen. He simply asked for a drink, and then he would have been on his way. But the bartender, basically being afraid of vampires, tells him to get out because it's closing time. So Cain leaves, and then he himself gets assassinated. And at first it's made to look like maybe it's just some bandits or something like that. But of course, you know, there is a deeper thing going on here. There's like a deeper conspiracy behind all this. But we're not going to get into that until later on in the game. So, he gets found by the necromancer Mortanius, who is part of the Circle of Nine. Mortanius resurrects Cain and basically gives him the vampiric gift in exchange for him you know, hunting down the people that murdered him and getting his revenge. Now, obviously, you know, Mortanius is not a good guy like that. He, he isn't going to do something like that without there being an ulterior motive, which there definitely is, but that's what you need to know. So, Kane comes back. He quickly finds his finds his uh, assassins and just murders them, you know, kills them all. And, but then Mortanius informs him, hey, you know, they weren't actually the people that masterminded. Yes, they were the ones that killed you, but they're not the ones who masterminded the hit on you. And to figure that, like to figure that out, he basically tells him that he needs to go talk to Ariel. The Balance Guardian, the one that was murdered, who is now a Spectral Wraith, at the Pillars. Nepraptor, your madness has shattered our dreams and blinded you. Keep your distance, or I'll send you back to hell, spirit! There is nothing left of me to fear, vampire. I'm only a shadow of my former self, Ari... The balance of the Circle of Nine. Even so, I can provide the answers you seek. I seek only a cure. There is no cure for death. Only release. You must destroy the sorcery. The sorcery that is now poisoning Nosgoth. Only then will you realize peace. The Nine of the Protectors of Hope were sworn to use their powers to preserve our world. Now these pillars have been corrupted by a traitor. My murder at the hands of this beast drove my love Napraptor mad. Now he spreads misery and pain among the circle, crumbling the very foundation of Nosgoth. You must restore balance. You must right the pillars of Nosgoth. I care not for the fate of this world. Then for yourself, Cain. Beware. The unspoken. So Cain reluctantly agrees to help out Ariel and restore the pillars, which I've never really understood, only because of the fact that the only reason that Cain even went there was to figure out who was the mastermind behind his death. And so he gets there trying to figure that out and then he leaves you know on his way to go save the pillars and to go save the entire world of Nazgoth, which just it's just kind of like, dude, what? You just said you don't care about the fate of the world. But instead of, you know, sticking to your guns, you're just like, okay, Ariel, yeah, I hope you all go kill your husband. So, I mean, I guess plot. So, I can't really complain because, you know, it's what gets the story to move on. So, we'll just move on as well. So, basically, Cain walks through a couple villages. He makes his way to Nup Raptor's Retreat. Nothing very interesting really happens in between now and Nup Raptor's Retreat. And so, that's pretty much all you really need to know about that one. So, Cain gets to Nup Raptor's Retreat. And basically, fights his way uh, through the dungeon. Uh, he gets to a part right before he fights Nup Raptor, where actually Malik is there. 
And uh, Malik is ready to protect Nup Raptor, but Nup Raptor basically tells Malik to piss off. And uh, then Malik pisses off. So, anyway, so right before he gets into that boss battle, there's like this giant skull right on top. It's basically been created to be a room. Um, Nup Raptor's retreats on top of a mansion. There's like a waterfall coming out of the mouth. That's something that you saw earlier in this video. So, that's Nup Raptor's retreat. Um, there is one thing I want to mention about that, but I'm going to save that for the theories part of this video because after the gameplay part, I'm going to do a theories part. And uh, we can talk about that later. So, but anyways, um, Nup Raptor, you know, he, Kane, sorry guys, Kane goes in there to find Nup Raptor. He basically destroys Nup Raptor, who's kind of a weak pussy, I guess. And uh, Kane takes his head and goes back to the pillars. So, after he defeats Nup Raptor and purifies the pillar of the mind, Ariel basically tells him, hey, you need to go and find Malik now. You need to take Malik out. And uh, being the, I guess, lapdog that Kane is in this game so far, uh, he says, yeah, sure, no problem. So he starts headed up to uh, Malik's Bastion is where he has to go. And the thing about Malik's Bastion is he can't really make it there um, by just walking. He has to find what's called a Vista Point. Um, in the game so that he basically he has to be able to see it so he can transform into a bat and then fly up over there now on the way there uh, he actually visits his hometown again Corhagen and uh, when he gets there it's just there's just this horrible plague going on and um, it's just killing everybody but it's funny because Cain doesn't even care you know, I guess about his hometown, uh, he like just doesn't give a fuck at all. In fact, he thinks it's kind of funny when he sees it. And uh, so this is kind of the part in the game where you can see that slowly but surely he's he's starting to embrace his vampiric gifts, basically, and he's starting to feel more like like a god, pretty much, which eventually he does feel like. And we'll get into that a little bit more, especially after this one. So, anyways. Uh, Kane walks through Corkhagen, he finds the Vista Point, and he makes it, or he sees it, um, Malik's Bastion. When he sees it, that gives him the ability to basically fast travel there, so he fast travels over there, and uh, he gets to Malik's Bastion, and he just starts to wreak havoc on you know, all kinds of different Seraphan soldiers, because uh, there's all bunch of soldiers there, and there's even some demons there, which is kind of like, well, what the fuck is going on with this shit, right? Um... So, anyways, he, he gets there, he, he goes through, he eventually gets to Malik, and then he, he tries to fight Malik, but Malik basically throws, like, this giant energy wave at him, um, which really fucks him up, and he has to retreat. And uh, he retreats, and, and what he does is he just basically goes back to the pillars to go ask Ariel what he needs to do uh, to be able to fight this guy. When Ariel just pretty much tells him that what he needs to do is he needs to go ask the Oracle for advice because she pretty much has no clue on how to kill Malik. Which begs the question of why did you even send Kane out there to begin with if you didn't know how to kill Malik? So Kane has to hunt down another Vista Point to make it to the Oracle's cave. Uh, it's like a labyrinth. Um, through the passage that he goes through it's like in a, an arctic wasteland basically and uh, there's like a huge huge like enclave that he has to fight his way through to get there um, when he finally makes it there he, he just basically meets uh, actually this is interesting he, he meets Mobius who if you play the other games you know exactly who that is um, at this point, Kane has no clue who that is. One interesting thing about that I want to say is I did I never really realized that Mobius was actually the Time Guardian until I played this game. And I don't know why I'm surprised about that, especially considering the fact that, I mean, he is the Time Streamer. So you, you know, I guess I should have just always assumed that, but I never really had the right information to go off of um, to really figure that out. But uh, anyway, so Mobius, he, he's over here being his own, you know, his old uh, deceptive self, trying to get Kane to do his bidding for him, basically. And uh, Kane, you know, says, hey, you know, hey, how can I defeat Malik? And uh, this guy, he doesn't really know. Oracle doesn't know either. Um, basically tells him, hey, go visit Vorador. So uh, Kane grabs his shit and he heads his way over to the Terrigent Forest where Vorador's manor is. 
a nobleman, seeking wisdom? Death has taught you well. Enough philosophy. I seek answers. Answers, indeed. I have them all if you have the questions. And what are the questions for these answers? King Atmar, the only hope to defeat the legions of the Nemesis. King Atmar, paralyzed by his princess's malaise. King Atmar, the useless. Pray, good sir, what are the questions? A pox upon your tricks and babble, old man. Answer me this. Who is Malik, and how can I defeat him? All in time, Sirrah. Yes, time. Unless you master it, it will master you. And now it's time for your answer. Malik, defender of the Nine and last of the Seraphim Sorcerer Priests. His vanity led to the slaughter of the Circle at the hands of the vampire Vorator. For his failing, his spirit was fused to a hellish set of magical armor. He has allowed no member of the Circle to fall since. What of this Vorador? Follow the glow of the Ignis Fatuous to the Termagant Forest. Ignis Fatuous? The Ignis Fatuous lights the path to hell, nobleman. Your path. Time, Kay? Next time. As I'm sure you just saw from that video, um, Mobius is kind of batshit crazy. Uh, but yeah, so Kane makes his way to the, the Terrigen Forest and he fights his way through uh, all kinds of monsters there's like grotesque looking demons and shit in the forest and uh, he makes it to he finally makes it to the manor of Vordor he's, he's initially repulsed by Vordor uh, you know still having some of his humanity he basically views Vordor as just being this this fucking monster and that he just fucking hates you know um, Vordor basically starts giving him a speech about how uh, vampires are gods and how the, uh, all the humans are basically just servants to the vampires and things like that. And at first, um, Kane's kind of like, you know, fuck that, I don't believe that. But the longer the conversation goes, the more he realizes that the Vordor is actually right. You know, and at least that's what he thinks. He feels like Vordor is right. And um, again, like this is just more kind of foreshadowing to the point that we're getting to um, that really shows you that there really is no good guys in this game um, considering the fact that I mean Kane what has he done so far has he done anything good really no he killed a bunch of people right um, he went to go meet Ariel who basically told him to kill more people and Ariel is probably the the one person in this game who's the closest thing to being good uh, so when the one person in this game that's the closest thing to being good is telling you to kill people then I'm pretty sure you know that there really is no good guy in this story. So, Vordor basically bitches him out, you know, and tells him, hey, you gotta stop fucking around with the humans, you gotta stop interfering in the world of the humans, um, because if you don't, it's just gonna bring more death and destruction onto the vampire race. He's like, especially one like you, I haven't seen one like you, as young as you, in a very long time. And initially, he's actually even kind of confused um, of how uh, Kane can even really be there, you know, considering Vordor isn't the one that actually brought him, um, who actually brought, you know, turned him and gave him the dark gift. Uh, now, we know, especially if you played this series, we know how that happened. Um, we're not going to get into that right now, right now. Um, but yeah, yeah, so pretty much we, we know what's really going on. So, right before Kane leaves, Vordor gives him a ring, um, which is just basically like a ring of protection, a ring that can help. Cain call upon Vordor if ever he gets into any trouble and uh, basically tells him you know hey get the, get the hell out of my house uh, because you know weaklings like you don't deserve to be here <laughs> right and so Cain's like alright whatever and he makes his way back to go and fight Malak again in the bowels of that black forest I found something worse than hell a vision of what I was becoming it's not often I see one of our own, especially one as young and foolish as yourself. Nonetheless, drink. Drink deep 
and indulge your gift. Gift? <laughs> Vorador thought my curse a blessing. That we were gods. That mortals offered their blood as sacrifice so that we could enjoy our supernatural powers. And somewhere, deep inside my new self, I knew that he was right. That mortal dreams were prayers. Prayers to us, begging us for power. I pondered this as the decadent old fool prattled on about his past. A boorish account of how he defeated Malek of the Seraphim and took his vengeance upon the Circle of Nine for supporting the Seraphim Holy War to exterminate us. your corpses! After slaughtering six of the sheep, I defeated their pathetic little shepherd, Mac. Since then, our kind has not bothered with the cattle, except to feed. And I suggest you do the same. Meddling with the affairs of man can do us no good. Seraphan witch hunts are much too tedious to concern ourselves with. Am I understood, Cain? Good. Take this ring. If you ever need assistance, it will summon you. Despite your youthful arrogance, you amuse me, Kay. It is such a pity to lose you to the abyss. Now be gone! Now, one interesting thing I do want to point out about that video that we just saw, the one in the beginning there, where um, you see, you know, Vorador killing the circle again. Um, there's a reason why I showed that again. Um, the, the reason being is I feel like the opening video is more of Mobius's account of how the whole assassination of the circle went down. And then the second one, the one that we just saw, is Vorador's interpretation of how the assassination went down. And uh, what I mean by that is, is the first time you see that video that we saw before this in the, you know, the beginning of the section on the story, um, Vordor basically hits Malik. It looks like he kills Malik by hitting him from behind, and that's it. That's the end of the story. And then in Vordor's version of events, he, he hits him, but it doesn't hit him very hard. Just basically gets him to turn around. And then he fights him man to man, like honorably. And then eventually ends up winning against Malik. Anyways. So th the reason why I th feel like that's interesting is to me it just feels like that's probably something that, that Mobius would do. Um, that if he was telling the story to other people from the Seraphan that he would actually, you know, he, he would make it look like Vordor was the one who was dishonorable. And that even though Malik failed the circle, you know, he still wants to make the circle look good. So he, he basically changed the story a little bit to make it seem like Malik... Um, was the honorable one in the fight but what's really fucked up about this shit is we find out in soul reaver 2 
At least I think it's Soul Reaver 2. It might be Defiance, but I'm pretty sure it's 2. I'll correct myself in the next video if I'm wrong. Um, but, but in that video, right, we actually find out that Mobius is the reason um, why the Circle was assassinated. Uh, Malik was actually with Mobius when all of that shit went down. And, uh, b he, like, you hear, you, there's literally a cutscene in that other game where you hear, you're, you're, you're literally Raziel, and you can hear the people calling for Malik. And Malik is standing right there next to Mobius. And Mobius is just basically telling him, no, you can't go, I need you to protect me, stay here. So Mobius knew, right, because he's a time streamer, right, so he sees all possible futures and shit. But Mobius knew what the fuck was going on. He, he knew that Vordor was being killed, and he did nothing about it. He just let it happen. And in fact, if it wasn't for him, then uh, Malik might have actually been able to save at least a couple members of the Circle. So after his little rendezvous with uh, Vordor, Kane actually heads north towards the village of Ustenheim. And uh, Ustenheim is the village where Janos Adrin was actually born. Um, Kane basically just reminisces about some of the stories that he's heard of, of Janos Adrin. Um, he doesn't really know who it is. You know, he's never met Janos, obviously. And um, also, again, Janos is supposed to be dead. Ironically enough, though, if you played these games, then you already know um, that his heart is in Kane, which actually is the reason why he's so powerful. So, uh, sorry if I spoiled anything for anybody. I'm sure I didn't, because if you're, you know, a minute and 21, I'm sorry, an hour and 21 minutes into this video, then you probably already know the storyline for these games, and I'm probably not spoiling anything. So, on his way there, Mortanius actually telepathically talks to him again, and basically tells him that there's three members of the circle that are up in uh, what's called, a place called Dark Eden. And uh, they're over there, they've basically been driven mad by the corruption of the pillars, so they've been making like all these weird experiments, um, and they're basically planning to take over Nosgoth with their own um, resources, basically, right? So what, what they're really good at is, is basically being like Dr. Jiro from Dragon Ball, like they're able to take people and turn them into something else. And in fact, when Kang finally gets to the area after discovering a Vista Point to go to use his bat flight um, to get there, he actually discovers like these grotesque monsters that are just like big giant blobs. They kind of remind me of the blob from the uh, what's the name of that game Inside. I don't know if you guys ever played that one, but at the end of that, at the end of Inside, you have to fight or you basically become part of this giant blob of humans, and it just looks like a looks like a, a ball of flubber or something. Uh, with a bunch of legs and arms and shit and that's basically the kind of monsters that you end up fighting there so he, Kane fights his way through Dark Eden and uh, he, he finally makes it to where the three wizards from the circle are uh, one of them the alchemist uh, he flees but right before he flees he he actually summons Malik and so now Malik's there and that guy got away. The other two wizards are trying to get away too. So Kane uses his ring that he just got from Vorador. And uh, basically summons him to the scene. Uh, Vorador pretty much tells him, hey, you know, I'll take care of Malik. Don't worry about Malik. You go fight the other two. And so Kane uh, leaves the fight between Malik and Vorador to go and chase the other two wizards. Vengeance. Vengeance for my eternity of suffering. Welp! As if you knew what eternity was. Grovel before your true master! Never. I'll hack you from crotch to gizzard and feed what's left to your brides. And uh, as you guys saw there, Vorador ends up using his werewolf form, which again, what the fuck, why are they turning into werewolves? Well, that's neither here or there. Um, so, Kane, Kane beats the two wizards. Uh, I'm trying to remember which, which ones they were. 
I believe it was Bane. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's Bane the Druid and uh, Jijul the Energist. And the one who got away was actually Anacroth. Um, the one who the one who summoned the Malik. And we'll we'll catch up with him later. So uh, just kind of put that on the back burner for now. So uh, Kane pretty much makes easy work of the other two. Um, he grabs their items that he needs to purify each one of their pillars, and um, he goes back to see how Vordor is doing. And then by this point, Vordor is already gone. Um, but sure enough, he beat Malik. He was able to destroy Malik. So Kane's just like, "All right, man. Yeah, cool. Whatever. You know." And so he grabs Malik's helmet. And uh, Kane heads back to the pillars. So he gets back to the pillars, and uh, he he purifies each one of their respective pillars. And then uh, Ariel tells him that he needs to go to Avernus next because he needs to go kill the Planner, who is another one of them, you know, another member of the Circle, uh, Azimuth, I believe his name is. Uh, so Kane complies. Right, he goes to the city. He finds that the city is just in chaos. Um, Azimuth, he, he's like a raving lunatic at this point, and uh, he's basically unleashed demons all over Avernus Cathedral. And uh, what Avernus Cathedral is, is it's kind of like a religious cult um, that Azimuth has created. Um, not a good one, though, <laughs> obviously, because he's, uh, you know, he's summoning demons. And uh, so basically, uh, Cain, he, he goes in there and he discovers something that is really important to the game series as a whole where while he's exploring Avernus Cathedral he basically finds like a rip in time like a time space dimensional rip and he walks in there and he finds the Soul Reaver and now the Soul Reaver as I'm sure most of us know is a very very important item um, it's pretty much one of the only artifacts that have the power to help change time and the thing i like about this series the most one of the things i've always loved about this series was the way that it handles time travel because we've all seen plenty of time travel movies um they're like really convoluted and they don't really make any sense and i've always felt like this series deals with time travel in a way that a lot of other series don't it's not perfect but it's still way better than most of the time travel stories that I've really seen. And so in this world, the way time travel works in this world is uh, time basically abhors a paradox, right? To, to give you the famous quote, um, and there, there isn't multiple timelines. There's not multiple dimensions or anything like that. So if you go back in time in this, in this uh, series, or, or in this world, I guess you would say, then and you change something, then you're basically destroying the timeline that you came from. Because there's only the one timeline, which has a lot of crazy implications when you really think about it. And when we get to the theories part of this video, I'm going to talk about Mobius and some of the crazy stuff to do with him. Um, but for now, all you really need to know is that uh, you, you pretty much need to have one item that's in two places at once to really be able to even change the timeline. Because if you just kill somebody then time will just rearrange itself so that it fixes the timeline basically and so eventually that's why the whole rest of the series is talking about fate and if you can change your fate or if everything is already predestined and it all hinges on the soul reaver and so that's one of the most important things that this series has um, it's, it's the only real key for Kane to actually change the fate of the world. So he gets the Soul Reaver. He also finds something called the Wraith Armor. And um, the Wraith Armor is pretty cool. It's like half in the spectral realm and half in the material realm. Um, so it can help uh, protect Kane from like spectral attacks pretty much. But it never comes back in the series like I was talking about earlier. We'd never see it again. So he, he gets out of there and he, he goes to find Azimuth and uh, he takes out Azimuth and uh, basically gets her eye and takes it back to the pillars to, you know, to purify the whole pillar of dimension because that's actually the, uh, that's, that's the pillar that she is. She's the guardian of dimensions, which is how um, he was able to go and find like a dimensional rift to even get the soul reaver in the first place. 
Um, real quick, guys, uh, interesting fact about the Soul Reaver. You remember me talking about Two Human earlier in the video? Well, the Soul Reaver was actually meant to be a weapon in Two Human. Uh, it was never meant to be in the Pillars of Nazgoth or um, Legacy of Cain. But eventually, uh, Dennis Dyack actually decided to take it out of that story and then put it into this story. But can you imagine like how different things would be with the Legacy of Cain series if the Soul Reaver was used for the series that it was intended to be used in, which was too human, like, we, we'd have a completely different story at this point. So, um, just to recap real quick, you know, obviously Kane wins, and he heads back to the Pillars to go talk to Ariel again, and to go clear the Pillar dimension. Hey guys, Future Vic Boss here. I just made this edit to make sure that I uh, clarify something. Azimuth is a girl, so I apologize about earlier in the video just now when I said azimuth he azimuth he that please ignore that um, it's a girl I just did not feel like re-editing the part where I was talking about you know time travel so um, that's why I'm just adding this in here so please disregard what I said about azimuth being a guy azimuth is a girl and I fucked up and thank you back to the video right before he leaves the cathedral um, Kane, he actually finds a time streaming device and Ariel basically talks to him and says uh, it, it will deliver him in time. It's meant to be like this cryptic message that we don't really understand at the moment, but it will definitely get explained in just a few minutes here. And so after purifying the pillar of dimension, Ariel tells him vaguely that he actually needs to go and stop the nemesis. And the nemesis, what he is, is he's basically a king from the north um, who's threatening to take over all of Nosgoth. And um, Kane's even like, dude, like, how does one man take out an entire army? Um, and so she pretty much just directs him to the city of Willendorf. And uh, the kingdom of Willendorf is ran by a king named King Atmar. And it, actually, the cutscene I'm about to show you guys is probably my favorite cutscene in the game. Um, I just like the whole part where Kane is uh, basically telling the Jester to get the hell out of his way. To me, I've always thought that was kind of funny. Uh, I just like the line that he uses there. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I'm sure other people think it's funny too, but whatever. So, anyways, um, he, he fights his way. Or actually, no, I'm sorry. He sneaks his way through Willendorf. And um, he learns a new spell. This is the Noble Men spell that I was talking about a little earlier. And that's how he's able to get in. And so he finally gets to the king, and uh, basically um, the gesture lets him in in a minute. And then, uh, yeah, so here's the cutscene. Watch it, and then we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. The court of King Otmar, shades of my former existence, proud and self-absorbed, surrounded by all the finery of the realm, secure in their ignorance. As I walked among them, I smirked, thinking of the carnage them at the hands of the legions of the nemesis, the glorious flames, and the inevitable rape and pillage. Out of my way, peasant! The stench of the fields hangs over you like a pall. The king sees no one. He is in mourning for the princess. He'll be in mourning for his kingdom soon, and he'll mourn for you even sooner if you don't get out of my way! Ooh! And so I won my audience, such as it was, with Otmar. He cared not for the invading armies from the north, only of the plight of his child. Her birthday present. To celebrate her birthday, I declared a contest. Whoever created the finest doll in the realm would be granted a royal favor. Hundreds of dolls were brought, but the winner was obvious. Elzevir the doll maker created a toy of such beauty that all were captivated by it. And all he would take in payment was a lock of her hair. Soon after, she became like this. A lifeless puppet. Whoever restores her to her former self shall have this kingdom! Thus, my hunt for the Dollmaker began. So Kane tracks down the Dollmaker who's actually living in a house on the Lake of the Lost Souls, and he finds a second doll. And basically, the princess's soul has been imprisoned in the doll. And the only way to bring her back is to basically kill the doll maker and um, to retrieve the doll. So, Cain does this 
because I mean he's Kane and the doll maker is the doll maker I mean did anybody really think that Kane wasn't going to be able to beat the doll maker so um, he easily easily defeats the doll maker uh, Kane gets the doll and he goes back to uh, Willendorf and basically gives King Otmar the, the doll uh, at this point, something interesting happens because Otmar actually, he's like, hey, you know, I'll give you my entire kingdom. And this part really shows you that that Cain, at this point, still has some of his humanity left. Um, because instead of just taking the kingdom, um, he's just like, dude, I don't want your kingdom. You know, I just need help beating the nemesis um, because I'm trying to find the guy who masterminded my death, I don't know if the nemesis has anything to do with it, but I keep getting all these cryptic messages from, like, these these ghostly figures that are, like, trying to guide me around and shit, and, um, pretty much I, I want to be done with their bullshit, and I want to find the guy who masterminded my death so I can finally kill him, so I can finally get my revenge, so I can finally stop being a goddamn vampire. And, um, uh, <laughs> man, I'm just telling you, like, this, this story, like, I love this game, I do, and I love the story, I do, but there's so many plot holes, I feel, in this story, like, why the hell is Cain fighting off an invading legion from the north when all he was trying to do was find the guy who masterminded his death? I mean, come on. I mean, it's not like the nemesis is the guy that killed him. We all know this. We all know Nemesis is not the dude who put all this stuff into motion so that Kane would die. I mean, why, why would he do that? There's no point to that at all. But anyways, so this is where we're going. So this is where we're going to continue to go, I guess. So um, they start the fight. They start a war between Willendorf and the Nemesis. And uh, his legions invade from the north. And they're just completely outmatched. And another ironic thing about this is Kane's army at this point, or Aunt Miller's army, whatever you want to call it, is actually known as the Army of Hope. Which again is kind of weird and ironic because of Kane and who he becomes. He ends up becoming a tyrant um, in, later on in the games. But uh, yeah, so anyways, they fight the armies of the Nemesis and the Nemesis kills King Otmar. And King Otmer basically says to Cain, you know, his dying wish is that he defends the land from the armies of the Nemesis. And Cain, he can't really promise that because, you know, he's severely outmatched, but he, he does anyways. And uh, he ends up having to retreat because there's just too many of them. And he actually finds a time streaming device. Um, we don't know this at this point, but Mobius is basically guiding all of these events. You know, he made sure that Kane got the Soul Reaver. He made sure to put this time streaming device exactly where it was going to be, where Kane was going to retreat to. All in the hopes that Kane would fall into his trap, pretty much, and then use the time streaming device, which he does. At once, the battlefield was gone. With a grand the ground was caked with blood and dirt, there was lush greenery, where chaos reigned only moments before this damning calm prevailed. Alas, it seemed I was stranded here. The time-streaming device lay in pieces at my feet. So he goes back into the past. The scenery around him changes from like a, a hellscape to lush greenery, you know, everything looks... Like it's in crisp, clean condition. You know, nothing is blown up or anything like that. And Kane quickly realizes that he's in the past. He is now in the time of William the Just. And William the Just is actually the nemesis that he was just fighting, but as a kid. So, Kane, he kills one of the men at arms, which is just a guard over at the castle. And one of the powers that is not really emphasized very much in this game, but one of the powers that Kane has is he can actually read minds and he can see their memories. So after killing this guy to figure out exactly where he's at and what's going on, he actually reads the mind of the guard and then he gets this vision. you stand idle as vermin destroy your crops? No! Does your house burn? No! 
will you allow this evil to continue? No! Will the wickedness end? It does! Do you believe? Yes! 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 Then take me to your king so that I can prepare you for the onslaught. Okay, so this is the part of the game where the storyline starts to get a little bit convoluted and a little bit hard to follow. Um, I've beaten this game now multiple times. I've done a lot of research for the making of this video. And I think I am pretty well versed in the lore of this series now. So I'm going to I'm gonna attempt, I'm going to give you guys my best attempt to explain exactly what's going on here. Because like I said, it is kind of hard to follow. So in that clip that you just watched, that is not the Mobius that we know. That is Mobius from uh, about 50 years in the past. But Mobius, remember I was saying he set all this stuff up. So this is this is how smart Mobius is. And this is why I honestly feel Mobius is probably the most evil character in the whole series. Do you guys remember when I was talking about how if you go into the past and you change the past, that it destroys whatever timeline that used to be in front of it? Well, Mobius designs all of this and sends Kane into the past with the full knowledge knowing right that he was going to do this and so he he destroyed an entire timeline to send Kane into the past with the soul reaver now the thing that's crazy about this and and the reason why I say it's kind of hard to follow is because this means that the mobius from the past the mobius from 50 years in the past was just going about his normal day and then he saw something, I don't know if that means he saw Cain come out of a portal or what, but he saw something that made him realize, oh, my uh, step one of my plan that I've been planning for the last however many years has gone through, which means my future self, yeah, my future self has actually sent Cain back into the past. So now I need to start with plan B. And, and what I mean by that is he obviously had this stuff planned from way back then. And so a future Mobius just had to assume that his past self would understand what was going on here. That his past self would be able to recognize that him in the future had already gone through whatever plan it was that he had planned way back then. Because Mobius isn't supposed to be um, with, with um, William the Just. He's not, he's not from that kingdom. So... Again, somehow Mobius realizes this, and he goes um, to to the kingdom of William the Just, and then he starts, you know, talking to the crowd, which is why he's saying, "Take me to your king." You know, would you guys, you know, not kill all the uh, werewolves or all the wolves in the pack? Yada yada. And this is how he wins the favor of the crowd, and this is how he wins an audience with William the Just, because at this point he's a nobody in this kingdom. And uh, he has to go through all of that shit just to be able to get his foot in the door. For what plans, we don't know yet in the story. But what we do know is, is simply the fact that, man, this guy is a fucking mastermind. Because if you guys remember, too, like he's still in the other games, right? Which means he has other plans. This is only part B of his plan. And, and with all the time travel shenanigans that are going to come up in the next... Um, sequels, right? And, and we'll talk about those when we get there. But with all of that stuff going on too, um, that means that even like 500 years ago when the whole attack on the circle happened, Mobius knew what he was going to do 500 years in the future. Like, he knew what was going to happen even all the way back then because if he didn't, then this timeline would not be possible. So do, do you guys see what I'm saying? Like, I, Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if, you're, if it's really kind of hard for you guys to understand how I'm putting it to you right now, that's that's legitimately the easiest way I can put it to you. And that is how, like, masterful uh, Mobius is when it comes to this stuff. So he, he wins his audience uh, with the king and um, basically just tells him, you know, you have a vampire assassin that's coming to kill you and you need to watch your back. 
So back to Kane though. So Kane realizes now that he's in the future that he could kill William the Just, who, like I was saying, used or becomes the nemesis. He can kill him now in the past and completely avoid this whole situation and not even have to fight uh, the nemesis to make his life easier, pretty much, so he can finally complete his journey. Um, so you know he goes to find William the Just and he makes it in there and he overhears. Uh, Mobius warning him basically after he won his audience with him um, telling him you know like I was saying this was going to be a vampire assassin coming to kill you and before he leaves though he gives William the soul reaver so now this way when both soul reavers clash you can create a new timeline like that you need the Soul Reaver to create a new timeline, which is why Mobius, and in later games, as we'll get to, and if you're fans of the series, you'll remember, one of the lines that Kane says in Soul Reaver 2, I believe it is, was, or it might have been one, I think it was two, but it might have been one, anyways, um, it, it, one of the lines that Kane says is actually, you know, before I made that decision, Mobius made sure that we were both armed with the Soul Reaver. And that's because that's what he needed. That's what Mobius needed to permanently change the timeline. Because without that, he wouldn't have been able to do that. So he gives William the Just the Soul Reaver. And then Cain eventually makes it in there to fight William. And he fights him and he defeats him. Ah, so it seemed I was in the land of William the Just. Fifty years before the battle I had just escaped would take place. The stronghold of William the Just. It was time for me to pay a visit to he who would become the nemesis and force Nosgoth on its knees. Yes, the, these weapons you've provided will see to that. Uh, uh, pray tell, Mobius, what game do you play? None, my lord. I only wish to aid you in vanquishing your foes. The weapons are but a token of my goodwill. And the news you bring, a vampire said to slay me? Where did you come upon such knowledge? It is of no consequence, sir. It was only out of concern for your majesty's life. Perhaps, perhaps. Very well, then. You may leave me now, but should I wish to speak to you? I will know, your majesty, and I shall be there in time. Ah, yes, the vampire. Uh, Mobius told me you would come. <laughs> hey, Victus! As his guards rushed to save him, William the Just's blood was already renewing my strength, replacing the life his sword had stolen from my veins. The poor fools come to aid their fallen leader. Let us have some amusement. Oh. A time streaming device. Strange. When coincidence seems too convenient, I prefer to call it fate. So Kane uses the conveniently placed time streaming device and to go back to 50 years in the future. Um, at this point, Kane thinks that Mobius his plans have been thwarted basically like he thought that Mobius was trying to uh, do something to help out uh, his plight by getting the king um, to become the nemesis you know by saying hey there's a vampire assassin he's coming to kill you let me protect you but little does Kane know um, that actually was not his plan at all his real plan was to get Kane to kill him so that that way it could create a, uh, a martyr for them so that the Seraphim can become stronger because this way now that this guy who was considered to be you know King William the Just is murdered he becomes the martyr and the poster boy for why they need to actually kill vampires so when Cain gets back to his own time not his own timeline remember that it's just his own time the timeline that Cain left can never come back that timeline is now completely destroyed uh, it, he can never go back to that new timeline so, um, yeah, Mobius basically committed genocide on the world, and that's why I say he's so evil. But anyways, um, Cain, he, he leaves the castle, and he can tell it's more fortified now as he's leaving. 
and uh, also he can smell a vampire blood coming from the south and the closer he gets to the source of this the more cheers he gets so basically what's happening is uh, the seraphim have rounded up the last of the vampires uh, right before Cain got there and they are systematically beheading every single one of them and um, unfortunately one of the people who is caught in this is actually Vordor and uh, one thing I want to point out about Vordor is uh, his his personality goes through a lot of different changes like he is not the same Vordor that he was even in this game you can tell he's a different kind of person um, in this game he seems more passive you know he doesn't seem as, as evil and as vile as, as the Mordor that we know uh, Vordor that we know excuse me and um, also actually late in later games of the series of Vordor he, he really just he goes through these weird um, personality changes and the only thing that I can think of that would really make sense for that is maybe every time they change the timeline right I mean obviously it changes the timeline but I think there might be something that we're not understanding about Vordor's past um, that that makes him become so evil maybe it was the whole circle thing going on you know like him killing everybody or as many as he could in the circle maybe that's what pushed him down more of an evil past in the original timeline um, but the point I'm trying to make is that in this timeline, I mean, I mean, he's captured by the Seraphim, where in the old timeline, he probably never would have been captured like that. So, Cain follows the smell of blood, and then he sees this scene right here. And so it is at this moment that Cain finally realizes that he was being manipulated the whole time by Mobius. He looks up at the sigil on his forehead and he realizes that that is the exact same sigil that is on the Pillar of Time. So it's at this point that he finally understands that the guy who's been leading him around and telling him to do all this stuff the whole time was actually one of the members of the Circle of Nine, being the Time Guardian. So Cain fights his way through the hordes right because all those people are coming after him seraphim people regular villagers everyone wants him dead basically and he runs through the fortress the seraphim fortress that uh, mobius has created um just killing you know people killing demons you know everything that mobius can throw at him and at one point mobius even actually summons like a spectral wraith version of cain uh, who i mean we can assume is a spectral wraith but it'd be kind of weird or kind of crazy if maybe that was a different version of Kane from a different timeline I doubt that Mobius has that kind of power but that's just food for thought something interesting to think about um, but anyway so he goes through the fortress and he basically kills everyone in the fortress until he finally captures Mobius ironic by going back in time and altering the past, you turned William the Just into the nemesis. I, you have seen my plan, vampire, as I have seen your destiny. The future says you die. But I am dead. As are you. I just want to say real quick that I love... Kane's reaction right there like he doesn't even hesitate or nothing he just cuts the guy's head off right then and there and if you play the other games when Raziel is talking to Mobius in Soul Reaver 2 and he's like no you know we both know that you're not going to kill me the one who kills me is your benefactor Kane um, that's because Mobius even back then 500 years before the events of this game he already knew that that was how he was going to die right there 
Um, now, later on, that becomes retconned in um, Defiance, because then in Defiance, they end up killing him earlier. Um, but w it is possible to do that, though, so I don't know if you really want to call it a retcon, only because, like I was saying, like I've been saying, right? Like, you can destroy entire timelines, so it does make sense that you would be able to do that. But long story short, Kane just takes him the fuck out. And he deserved it. You know, I mean, I was actually really satisfied when I got to see that because uh, his death in defiance kind of left something a little bit to be desired. But that's a whole nother conversation. So, anyways, um, he grabs Mobius' uh, hourglass, which is the artifact that he needs to purify the Pillar of Time. And um, when he does this, he actually gets a telepathic message from Mortanius again. And uh, Mortanius just basically tells him, hey, come back to the pillars. I want to talk to you. And um, Kane obliges, you know, he goes over to the pillars. And then we finally see what is one of the last cutscenes of the game um, begin. You betrayed us, Mortanius. You had Kane killed and turned him into a monster. You set him upon us. It had to be. Napraptor's insanity poisoned all of our minds. The Circle had failed in its sworn duties. It had to be destroyed. Failed our duties? Idiot! The Circle exists for us. We don't exist for it. Our powers will save or damn Nosgoth at our whim. Stand with us, Mortanius, or die. Then I shall die. If the Circle is to be destroyed, you have to die as well, Necromancer. I admire your cunning, but you will not escape your fate. Nay, I will embrace it, but my death will leave one more to take Princeling. Finish me! And so the fight between Kane and Mortanius begins. Um, I'm pretty sure we all know who wins this battle. Uh, Kane destroys him. Um, one thing I will point out, though, is... I know it probably seems like Mortanius is super powerful, but the thing about this is, and we learn this in later games, is um, that yes, that's Mortanius, but it's actually Mortanius being possessed by the leader of the Hilden. And the reason why the leader of the Hilden is doing this is the pillars is not just something that happens to like keep the world in balance or anything like that. The pillars are actually a key. And what they do is they keep the Hilden trapped within some kind of like space-time dimension what they're stuck into. I guess you can kind of equate it to the Sacred Realm um, from Zelda. Like just imagine if they were Ganondorf, right? Like they're trapped in this one realm. And the Hilden King is basically all he can do. He's still powerful enough to possess people. So the whole reason that he's even doing this is is so that way he can get Cain to basically kill everybody in the circle and then he's hoping that Cain will kill himself because if he does then it will actually unlock the key that holds them within that realm so in an ironic like twist of fate Cain you know going in well if we're going by the canon ending um Cain deciding to become the ruler of the world actually saves the world because if Cain had not taken the option to basically become the leader of a dead world um, and he didn't realize this but I guess uh, serendipity right you know if he had done it if he had decided to be good then it actually would have unlocked the key for the Hilden and the Hilden would have been able to escape. Now, we can go into more depth about the Hilden in um, an upcoming video. We'll probably have to talk about them a lot in Soul Reaver 2. So, we'll leave it at that for now. But the only reason I, I mention is because the next scene we see after this, 
uh, Mortanius actually transforms into uh, the king of the Hilden's original form. And um, I know it probably wouldn't make any sense, or people wouldn't get it at least. They wouldn't catch what's really going on unless I was, you know, to actually explain that to you guys first. So uh, let's, let's take a look at that one now. I serve no one. Indeed, such narrow vision. Don't you see? My silencing of Ariel and its calculated repercussions is but the first act in my theater of Grand Guignol, of which you are the tragic hero. Play on, little vampire. Play on. Fay Victus! And so with the defeat of Martinius and the Hilden King, there was only one more guardian to kill. And we all know this story. And Cain has to make a choice. Either he can save the world by sacrificing himself, but he actually wouldn't have saved the world, keep that in mind. But that was the choice. That's what they thought was going to happen. Or he can condemn the world and rule over it as a king, right? As, as basically the overlord of the entire world. Uh, now, um, the canon version of the ending is that he did decide to rule the world, which is what leads us into Soul Reaver. And, uh, you know, well, we're going to talk about Soul Reaver, guys. We're going to get there. Um, but that's all for the end of Blood Omen. That's all you guys really need to know. I'll play the last cutscene for you guys just so you can get a sense of completion um, in terms of the cutscenes. But then after that, we're going to jump into the theories and closing arguments section of this video. Uh, where It won't be too long. I just There's just a few things that I wanted to talk about um, that I wasn't able to put in anywhere else in the video. So enjoy the last cutscene, guys. I am the last pillar, the only survivor of the Circle of Nine. At my whim, the world will be healed or damned. At my whim. Once I embraced my powers, I realized that Vorador was correct. We are gods, dark gods, and it is our duty to thin the herd. <laughs> In his life, he was unknown, a petty noble. In death, he was unknown, yet by choosing oblivion, he restored balance to the land. Shades cast no shadows. Okay, so this first one, uh, I used to think this was a theory up until I made this video. And then I did a little more research into the franchise and actually found out that the thing that I had theorized about back then is actually true. And that first one is going to be that uh, Mobius is actually a vampire. And uh, yeah, I know, crazy, but hear me out. So I guess when you're the guardian of time, you actually you don't die. You become immortal. Um, now, you can die if you get your head cut off or something like that, which we've obviously see, seen. Uh, so the guy who was the time guardian before uh, Mobius... He, you know, he was killed and then Mobius was named as a new successor. Um, he was a human. And back then, what they used to do as part of tradition was they would actually take the human guardian and turn them into a vampire. And that's actually what they did to Mobius, which is why he hates the vampires so much. Because he was actually born a human. He lived his life as a human. And we became the time guardian 
Um, he actually lived in like a vampiric uh, cathedral uh, with a bunch of other vampires and they pretty much forced him to take the dark gift. So although that isn't a theory anymore because it has been confirmed, um, there was one theory that I had about that, which is probably going to sound stupid, but you know what, these are just theories, you know, so it doesn't matter if it sounds retarded, because <clears throat> uh, there's some of you people out there who play these games, you're probably thinking to yourself, then, okay, well, you know, if he is a vampire, then how can he use his staff and not be affected by it? And the only thing I can think of for that is this, in Defiance, when Cain loses the uh, the heart of darkness uh, Janos's heart right he didn't die like somehow he was still alive and it was never really explained so my whole theory behind this is this if you become a vampire due to the heart of darkness then removing the heart will not kill you so I guess my theory on this one would be is Mobius is the one who had the heart of darkness before Cain and then he gave it to Mortanius after seeing the future and he knew that the only way for him to succeed at what was going to happen would be for Cain to get the heart of darkness which is why he decided to let Cain have it and that's also why his staff doesn't hurt him because the staff is only supposed to hurt vampires right but it, what, what is it do? It, it attacks their heart that's what it does and so that's why in all those cutscenes you can see like Kane grabbing his chest later on in the series. You see Raziel doing the same thing. Because that's how Mobius' staff works. It, it affects the vampiric heart. And since he no longer has a vampiric heart, it doesn't hurt him anymore. And it also makes more sense because we see Mobius like in multiple different timelines and that's something i had always wondered about myself because it's like dude so is this guy immortal or is this guy somehow able to travel through these different time periods but if he did that isn't it supposed to change the future and erase the previous timeline you know etc etc so it just makes more sense that he is actually a vampire and can't die and that is actually how he's able to stay in all these different timelines so he what he's doing is because he can see the future like it's not like he is traveling literally traveling to different timelines all he is really doing is talking to people the way he needs to talk to them at whatever time it is that he meets them in that specific timeline because he can already see the future he can already see the possible you know like the possibilities uh the different timelines that could result and so because of that it gives him uh, a bit of insight as to what's going to happen that's also why if you remember earlier in the video i talked about how um the mobius from 50 years in the future got destroyed and just relied on his past self to be able to figure out oh um, future self must have done plan A of my overarching plan so so I better start enacting plan B so that's the first one so the second one is actually going to be Blood Omen 2 is what happens if you fail to kill William the Just so in that game in Blood Omen 2 and wish me luck guys because the story for that one is so convoluted and makes no sense in fact, it makes so like such little sense that the only way for that game to make sense is if what happens is, is if you die, or basically almost die, playing as Kane uh, up against uh, William the Just, um, then Soul Reaver, or I'm sorry, Blood Omen 2 is what happens. So I'm thinking that what happens is, is if you if you can't beat William, um, Kane gets defeated. And basically, that is the real plot to behind uh, Blood Omen 2. And we'll talk more about that when we get there, too. And again, like, wish me luck, guys. Um, I'm still confused about Blood Omen 2. And I've played Blood Omen 2 multiple times. It doesn't really make sense um, why that's even in the timeline. Um, I only mention it because the next part is, um, or the next little theory I have for this is actually that Kane from the original uh, Soul Reaver is actually Blood Omen 2 Kane. And uh, what I mean by that is I think maybe Kane 
he had this vision basically of the future um, and it all stems from Blood Omen 1 which is why I'm mentioning it in the Blood Omen 1 video and uh, he basically sees what would happen if he failed and then so it's, it's almost like a dream that he has and uh, he realizes that he has to go back in time again at the end of Blood Omen 2 and then basically he does that he goes back and then he kills William the Just this time and that's how he actually succeeds so in, an, in other words you, you can imagine that the theory that I'm trying to trying to show here that I'm trying to argue for is that basically all of Blood Omen 2 takes place in between um, the time when Kane starts the fight with William and right after the fight ends so basically he starts the fight and then if he loses Blood Omen 2 happens and then basically he travels back to that point in time and then he fights William again and he wins the second time so again like this is kind of hard to explain because the whole game's plot is really hard to explain so forgive me guys um, but yeah we'll definitely jump more into this topic on the Blood Omen 2 video and uh, yeah so let, let's for now let's just go on to the next one um, the next one is going to be up in Nup Raptors retreat you get to the part where there's like a skull on the mountain and um, Kane you can walk up to the eyes and you can look through the eye sockets and if you look through the one on the left it, it shows basically um, Nazgoth like in a peaceful in a peaceful time you know like like everything is perfect it's a paradise and if you look at the one on the right it's like the whole world has been destroyed and now for a long time people have always assumed that that the one that shows the peaceful time is just how good things could be and the one on the right that shows the world overran by corruption is just how bad things could be. But my whole thing about this is what I think is really going on is I think Moby has helped to make that. And uh, what it's really showing is uh, the past in, in which Nazgoth is flourishing. And then the future in which Cain has basically corrupted the world. So in other words, I literally think... The, the one that shows the goodness is the one that is showing the past and the one on the other side is literally showing oh, what the future looks like. Now you might be wondering why would Nup Raptor need something like this? Maybe Nup Raptor had a good idea of what was going on with Mobius. Of what was going on with the circle. You know, maybe somehow, you know, he, well, I mean he was already friends with Mobius. Maybe Mobius just told him. You know, that could easily be it. And um, I think Nup Raptor has these because maybe in a way he's trying to change uh, specifically the past because he wants his wife to not be dead pretty much. And he's trying to find a way to do that. But uh, unfortunately, obviously, Kane kills him before he can find a resolution to that. Okay, so earlier in the video, um, I was talking about how I had a crazy tinfoil hat conspiracy theory on who made the Wraith armor, how it came into existence. And uh, so now's the part in the video where I'm going to get into that. And most of you are probably going to laugh at me. And I don't blame you. Because this is probably going to sound pretty stupid. But my my theory on the Wraith armor is that it was actually made by Kane himself. And I know that might sound a little far-fetched. And sure, sure, I understand that. Uh, but you got to remember, there's still one game that we never saw. I mean, who would need armor like that and why would they need it well Kane could definitely use an armor like that if he's going up against the elder god and so I basically think that even if Kane didn't make it himself I do think that Kane probably either made it or had it created for him so that he could fight the elder god and because he knows that he needs that armor when he first you know becomes a fledgling vampire at the beginning of this game he effectively travels back in time because uh, once Mobius is dead I'm sure he has access to the time streaming chambers and he can pretty much go wherever he wants to so it, in order to make sure that history stays on the course that it needs to stay for Cain to presumably eventually kill the Elder God he basically goes back in time and uh, puts away the Wraith armor into the dimension where it needs to be so that he can find it when he's younger because you got to remember one thing Kane by the end of the series has gone through a lot of shit 
if anything, he, him and Mobius are the two that know the most about the timelines. And they're also the two that know how the timelines should have originally went. Um, by this point in the in the franchise, right? Like by the end of the franchise. Now, again, we didn't get the Dark Prophecy game, but by the end of Defiance, Kane pretty much knows just about everything that Mobius knows. So he would be smart enough to realize that once he sees the Wraith armor and realizes what it is, he would remember what it looked like. He would know that he needs to take it back. So that's my crazy theory on the Wraith armor. Um, I legit think that's actually probably what happened there. Um, maybe you guys don't agree with me, and if not, that's cool. But um, at this point, headcanon is better than nothing, because uh, we never got that third game to finish out. Oh, I'm sorry, that sixth game to finish out the, uh, the series. So the next thing we're going to talk about is not actually a theory it's more of a concept and the reason I want to go over this is because it's going to be important um, for the videos in the future right for the videos coming up we need to discuss this concept and uh, what the concept is this it's something that in the legacy of Kane lore community is called the three paradoxes now we're not going to talk about the second and the third paradox right now uh, we can save that for their respective videos, which would end up being Soul Reaver 2 and Soul Reaver, I uh, no, Defiance. It would be Soul Reaver 2 and Defiance. And uh, so, what the three paradoxes is, the first paradox is, in this game, when Kane gets sent 50 years into the past, and he goes up against William the Just. Now, if you're this far into the video, I probably don't need to explain to you um, exactly what's going on like how they can change events um, with the reaver it's the only way that they can really change events in the timeline there has to be two of the exact same thing basically at the same place at the same time uh, for there to be enough of a uh, I think it's called a temporal distortion in the time stream to actually be able to change the flow of time um, and that's again. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this earlier, but um, that's the thing I like about this series. It's, it it handles time travel very well. I really like the concept of how basically time is almost like this omnipotent being. Um, it, it probably is the closest thing to God that we even get in this series, considering the Elder God is proven to be pretty much a leech on the wheel of life. Um, so I mean, he's not really a god. We all know this. So time is pretty much the only real god in this uh, realm, and um, I, I just really like you know, the, the whole quote with Cain where he's saying that you know throw a pebble into a stream and the water would just rush around it. But uh, the important thing to know about the first paradox is it, it, it completely changes the way things are supposed to have gone in the first timeline. Obviously, Vordor is killed, and uh, we don't see him again until uh, Soul Reaver 2, because he ends up getting caught by Mobius and the Seraphan, who are actually able to kill Vordor very, very, very early um, in the timeline. Now, he should have been around for longer, but obviously he wasn't because he gets killed, and this becomes a major event. You see, Vordor actually held a pivotal role in this series. Um, not only was he the one who killed six members of the Circle of Nine. Um, oh yeah, and by the way, I was wrong, so I'm gonna take it back right now. He didn't kill Malik, uh, so I'm sure there's still gonna be someone in the comments that's like, "Oh, you know, you said that he killed Malik." No, okay, so no. To be fair, he did not kill Malik the first time. He did kill him the second time, which is why I said the seven members. Um, that were destroyed by Vorador, including Malik earlier in the video, but I was mistaken um, When he attacked the Circle of Nine the first time he did not kill Malik, but Malik was turned into a spectral wraith um, Vorador, he's the guy who created the Soul Reaver I think of all of the information he could have been giving to Raziel and Cain if he had still been alive And Mobius knew this you know, and that's why Mobius so badly wanted Kane 
to go back into the past and change everything that happened is because Mobius knew that Vordor was going to be a problem. I mean, if it wasn't for Vordor, then Raziel never would have really realized that he needed to go talk to Janos Aldrin. That's exactly who told Raziel to go see Janos Aldrin. It was Vordor. So I guarantee that the first paradox, although it is, you know, commonly referred to as the fight between Cain and the fight between William the Just, is was actually Mobius's yeah, Mobius's ploy to get rid of Vordor. And um, as we can all tell, it really fucks shit up. So the next thing I want to get into is this misconception about what the pillars are in the Legacy of Kane series. Because it seems like a lot of people seem to think like they're just like this mystical force that, you know, is inherently connected to the earth. And that if the pillars become unbalanced and the earth becomes unbalanced and all that stuff. But that's not really what's going on here. Uh, what the pillars are is basically a, a lock and key. They are what keep the Hilden and basically the demon dimension. And if that key becomes fully corrupted, right? If, they, if that key is weakened enough, then it can actually let the Hildens out. Which is what the Hildens really want. That's what the Hilden Lord wants um, at the end of Defiance. And um, in case anybody doesn't know this about Mortanius, the uh, necromancer, he is being possessed by the Hilden King, which is something that we end up learning in Defiance. And um, the only reason I bring it up here in the Blood Omen video is because the Hilden King has set all of these events into motion, knowing full well that Cain is not going to do the sacrifice knowing that he is going to take basically a wrong path right by taking over the world letting the the pillars become corrupted yada yada and he's doing all of this so that he can escape because he does not want to be in the demon realm anymore um, pretty much thousands of years ago right there was a war between the hildens and the vampires, the ancient vampires, not the ones that we know of today. So the, the ancient vampires were more like Yaros Audrin um, than the ones we see of today. But long story short, and we, I'll go into further detail with that in upcoming videos. Um, but for now, um, the moral of the story is this. Everything that happens in Blood Omen, although it seems like Mobius is the mastermind, behind all this he's not it's the Hilden King he's he's trying to get the pillars to be corrupted so that they can escape so that they can get their revenge on the vampires and so that they can basically take back the land of Nosgoth which they feel belongs to them rightfully so that's what's going on with the pillars um, just be aware of that going forward um, because like I said it will come up frequently um, especially in the next couple of videos. So, um, that being said, I'm about to bring this video to a close. Um, it's been a good time. I had a lot of fun working on this. Uh, the next video is going to be on Soul Reaver. I might, I haven't decided yet, I might roll Soul Reaver 1 and Soul Reaver 2 into one video instead of making a video for each. Only because Soul Reaver 1 and Soul Reaver 2 were pretty much the same game. Um, Soul Reaver 2 is the continuation of what they wanted to do with Soul Reaver 1, but they couldn't finish Soul Reaver 1 the way they wanted to, which is why there's so much cut content. Um, like the priestesses never made it into the game they were supposed to be in Soul Reaver 1. Uh, basically, they ran out of time, and so they had to take a lot of the ideas that they had for Soul Reaver 1 and put it into Soul Reaver 2. So, I haven't decided yet. Uh, maybe I'll make a shorter video for Soul Reaver 1, or maybe I'll just do both at the same time. Um, but either way, if you stayed around this long and um, you're still here, please, if you like the video, please subscribe. Um, please share this. Please help me out, guys. I'm trying to grow this channel, and uh, I'm going to be working hard trying to get that to happen. Uh, very much appreciate it. 
If you guys would leave me a like. Uh, if you guys want to contact me or anything, feel free to hit me up. Uh, I'm always in, on Discord, and you know, if you're interested in talking to me, just leave a message, and I'll help you guys get hooked up with a really cool friend of mine who has a Discord channel. Um, Highly and Fox, shout out to you. And um, yeah, so thank you guys for your time. Um, thank everybody uh, who's been there to answer questions for me in the background to help me get this channel up and running. And um, thanks, guys. Thanks for visiting my channel. Thank you for your time. And I'll see you guys soon in the Soul Reaver retrospective video. Late.